Thank you, Shai, for the introduction. So today is joy to work with me here, Blari. So today I'll talk about format preserving encryption, or FPE, which is a widely used method to encrypt credit card numbers and fields in legacy databases. So as the name suggests, under FPE, ciphertext will have the same format as the plain text. For example, if you encrypt credit card numbers, the ciphertext would also look like credit card numbers. So why would one need FPE? So in legacy databases, the schemas expect some certain format, and if you use an ordinary encryption, you would destroy the format and disrupt the system. So using FPE would avoid this kind of issue. Syntactically, an FPE scheme consists of an encryption scheme and a decryption one, both deterministic. So encryption text as input a key and some string that you could have tweak to map a plain text to a ciphertext of the same format. For example, if you encrypt credit card numbers, the format or the domain is the set of all 16 decimal digit numbers. So FPE is now widely used in practice. There are several companies offering FPE products. So in uh, 2016, NIST nice sanctioned an FPE standard specifying two schemes, FF1 and FF3, both based on AES. So they insist very strong requirements on the security. So an earlier version of the standard had a proposal FF2, but it was then dropped because the NSA found an attack of a 2 to the 64 plain text cell text pairs despite the 128-bit key length. But under the traditional uses of FPE, the devices of the same organization would share the same key K. But if one device is compromised, which is quite likely, then the security of all devices will be affected because they share the same key. So it is highly undesirable with like to localize the damage. So therefore, we propose what we call identity-based FPE or IBFPE. So an IBFPE scheme consists of a base FPE scheme F and a key derivation function KD. Now, each device has a different subkey derived from a common master key K and the identity of that device. Thanks to the use of different subkeys across different devices, the damage is co confined in compromised devices. Now recall that the base FE scheme app will be built from AES, so therefore we'd like to build the key derivation function from AES as well, and the IB FE scheme better have 128-bit security to meet these requirements. But before we can even design secure schemes, we need to understand what security even means. Therefore, I will begin by defining security notions for IBFPE. We then give generic attacks on any IBFPE schemes, generalizing an attack on FF2. So these attacks suggest that if you want one to die bit security for IBFPE, your subkey length must be at least. 256. We then give two uh, constructions for IBFPE. One of, uh, of that was inspired by the desire of DFF, a recent uh, FPE proposal to NIST. And then we use our framework to analyze the security of DFF. In particular, DFF uh, targets what it calls delegation, but it doesn't explicitly define what it is. So our framework uh, can be seen as formalizing this security goal. Now before we get into the security notions of IBFPE, as a warm-up, let me review the classic PRP security notion for FPE. So under this notion, an adversary A is dropped into either a blue world or a red world. In each world, the adversary is given two oracles to encrypt and decrypt. In the blue world, 
the oracles implement the true encryption and decryption. In the red world, the adversary will receive random strings subject to some unavoidable constraints of FPE. For example, if you encrypt the same message twice under the same twig, you would receive the same set of text, and so on. So now the job of the adversary is to guess which word it is in by outputting a bit B prime, and we define its advantage as the probability that its guess is correct, normalized so that a random guess uh, has advantage zero. So let's now move on to the um, security notions of IB FPE. So I, let me begin with a key recovery notion. So under this notion, the adversary is given encryption and decryption oracles as usual. But we also give it a challenge oracle for it to indicate which identities that it like to recover some keys. Moreover, the adversary is given an exposed oracle to indicate what identities that it like to compromise to get back the corresponding subkeys. So at the end of the game, the adversary has to output an identity i and a subkey j. It wins the game if i is in the challenge list and j is indeed the subkey of i. To prevent trivial winning, we prohibit the adversary from querying the exposure oracle and the challenge oracle with the same identity. We can likewise define an indistinguishability notion. So again, the adversary is dropped into either a blue world or a red world. In each world, it is given four oracles as before. In the blue world, the oracles implement the true encryption and decryption. In the red world, they will do that only if the query identity is not yet in the challenge list. Otherwise, it would return random but consistent answer. And the adversary has to guess uh, which word it is in. So intuitively, indistinguishability implies key recovery, but the opposite direction doesn't hold. To prove this implication, the basic template in literature is to run the key recovery attack to get um, an identity with its subkey. And then we compare the encryption oracle on that particular identity with the encryption scheme on that particular uh, subkey on a couple of testing messages. So here we basically follow the same template, but because the domain is tiny, one need to calibrate the number of testing messages to ensure that the bow is good. So under both of our notions, we say that uh, an adversary is not adaptive if for query three, the exposure oracle on an identity I prime, it never queries the encryption or decryption oracles on the same identity. So what's the difference between adaptive uh, and non-adaptive? The issue is that adaptive attacks effectively lead to what's technically known as selective opening attack, which is notoriously hard to deal with. So when we propose our constructions, we only prove non-adaptive security. While we don't uh, consider adaptive security, we are not aware of any attack violating that for our constructions. So now you've seen the security notions, and we are ready to give attacks on any IB API scheme. So these attacks are non-adaptive and parameterized by two parameters, P and Q. The quality of those attacks depend on what we call key diversity of the key duration function. So basically, it's the, num the expected number of subkeys that you get if you derive subkeys for Q random identities under random master key. So the first attack, which we call matching attack, works well if key diversity is low. In particular, if key diversity is less than Q over 4, then its advantage is at least a false. The second attack, which we call exhaustive search attack, works well if key diversity is high. In particular, if key diversity is greater than Q over 4, then its advantage is around PQ over 2 to the subkey length. So these attacks mean that if you want 128-bit security, you need at least 
256 bit sub key length. So now we want to build secure IP FA scheme. But designing good FA scheme alone is difficult, and there are already good ones in the literature. So therefore, we aim to build a key generation function to transform an existing good FA scheme to a good IP FA one. As informed by the text, you need to start with an app base FA scheme app of 2 bit key length and then view a key generation function of a proper signature. So we have two constructions. The first uh, makes four AES calls, and its group is in a standard model. The second is faster, but uh, its group is in the ideal cipher model. But both gives pretty good bounds. So let me introduce the first construction that we call the PIF construction. So we simply require that the key generation function uh, is a good pseudo-random function, or PIF, which is quite a common practice. So let me recall the classic PIF notion. So again, the adversary is dropped into either a blue word or a red word. In the blue word, in both words, it is given an oracle to derive subkeys. But in the blue word, it is given back the actual subkeys. In the red word, it will be given random strings. And the adversary has to guess which word it is in. So our PIF construction for IBFE scheme is simply a pair F and KD, where the first is a good uh, FE scheme of 2 bit key, and the second is a good PIF. So this is a good IBFE scheme, uh, in particular, for any non adapted adversary A, uh, attacking the indistinguishability security of the PF construction, we can reduce that to adversary B and A bar attacking the PF security of KD and the PRP security of F, respectively. Uh, here in this formula, the PRP advantage has a blow up U, where U is the number of identities involved. So at the first glance, it looks pretty bad. But here, note that F has 2 bit key length. So if the, the base FE app is well designed, say you model it as an ideal FE, and we still have um, n bit security. So in our PF construction, we want the, uh, the key generation function to be a good PIF. But at the same time, we want to view it from AES. So we can achieve that by using the XR PRP constructions. So in particular, you run four AES calls on the identities with the proper domain separation, and then X on the four outputs accordingly to produce a 2 bit output. And using uh, uh, my recent result in the trial work with um, Dai and Tessero, we can show that it is a good PIF. Now you've seen the first construction. Let me now show you the, the, the other construction that we call the double construction. It is inspired by the proposal the app of Vance Abelari to Nice. So under this construction, you first need to encode identities to have um, two n bit strings. And then you encipher those using AES to produce two n bit output. And the encoding is done via public maps M0 M1. So we require that M0 M1 are injective and have disjoint images. Um, so that the subkeys of different identities uh, look independent. So our double construction for IBFE is simply um, consists of uh, a good uh, FPE app of 2 bit key and the key derivation function that you've just seen. And it is a good IBFE scheme in particular, for any non adaptive adversary A attacking the indistinguishability security of the double construction, we can reduce that to an adversary A bar attacking the PRP security of the base FEF. So again, the PRP advantage has a blow up U, but if F is well designed, say it is modeled as an ideal FEE, then we still have enemy security. Now, in the theorem statement, we have a very stringent requirement on the PRP security of F. 
and that will be satisfied if f is modeled as an ideal FBE. But at the end, one has to instantiate f by using some concrete reward FBE scheme. That would be nice if we actually can prove something for that specific uh, reward FBE. So to answer that, we need to understand the structures of reward FBEs. So all of them are built uh, from Fisto network. So this picture illustrates a four-rail Fisto. So an input is interpreted as a pair L0, R0. You then would iterate through the rails to produce intermediate output L1, R1, L2, R2, and so on using route functions F1 and F2, respectively. And reward FEEs take the NIST standards F an 8th route or 10th route FISTO. So now setting, we need an FE scheme of 256-bit key length, uh, and that should be built from AES 128. And the recent DFF proposal should Suggest the following way to build just a Feistel Bay FE scheme. So you would use balance Feistel, and here's how you should design your RAL function MI. So the RAL function tag as input a key J1, J2, a trick key, and a message X. So internally, it will run an AES call on key J1 and truncate that properly. The AES output will be the concatenation of the round number i, the tweak t and the input x, and that will be xr with the key j2. So how good is this um, faster based FE scheme? Uh, empirically, it has very good security. Uh, the, a caveat is that when the domain is super tiny, you need to uh, add more rounds. 10 rounds is not enough. Otherwise, uh, my recent work with um, Blurry and Tessero actually show that one can recover the messages. But theoretically, our existing proof techniques give very poor bar for Feisto. In particular, if an adversary makes a uh, queue query, we can at best prove that um, uh, can bound the advantage uh, by Q over square root of big N where big N is the size of your domain. But in the FE setting, big N can be very small. So if you are encrypting pins, your big N is only 10,000. And it's way too weak for what we need. Uh, we want something roughly Q over 2 to, P, 2 to the 256 if we want good indistinguishability security for the double construction. But now we are running into a huge theoretical obstacle. So we have to target a weaker goal, namely proving key recovery security for the double construction. And we actually prove that for a broad class of IBFA scheme that we call pre-masking based. So that class includes the double construction as a special case. So all members of the class use the same key derivation function as the double construction. For the base F is, uh, scheme F, the encryption and decryption scheme are associated with corresponding encode and decode algorithms, respectively. For example, if you encrypt uh, a message X under uh, key J1, J2, and trick T, you would need to run uh, encode on input key X and output accordingly. But the, pro the, the, the important point here is that encode doesn't have direct access to the key. It has to make a um, procedure call to this white box. So in this white box, you first XR the input with uh, J2, and then you encipher that with um, AS with key J1. Likewise, decode doesn't have direct access to the key it has to make calls to the same white box. So intuitively, if the white box does a good job in protecting the key, then there's no way the adversary can recover it. But we need to formalize this intuition. So the white box resembles the desk X construction of brown reverse for extending the key length of a block cipher. Therefore, we name it desk X bar. But the difference here is that um, 
we don't have the uh, the outer external here. And the reason we can do uh, this little optimization is that in both in code and decode, we only make forward queries to that expire. We never run backward queries. So this dash x bar is a block cipher, but you can view it as a special FE scheme where, where the only possible tweak is the empty string and the identity is the empty string. So what we need to prove is the, um, to show that dash x bar has good critical risk security. So in particular, if an adversary A doesn't make any decryption query, then this expert has excellent critical risk security. And we have to prohibit the adversary from making decryption queries because we don't have the, an outer XR here. But uh, for pre-masking based IBFE schemes, that is fine because we always make forward queries. We never make backward queries. And as a um, corollary, pre-masking based IBFE uh, has some very good key recovery security. So here you may notice that there's some curious n over log n factor. And underlies is, is a very interesting bonds into beans phenomenon. Uh, but uh, I have no time to talk about that today, but we can talk offline. So now we can uh, use the framework that you've just seen to analyze the security of the DFF proposal. So DFF is a recent proposal by Vance and Blary aiming to replace FF2. So this FP scheme internally derives some keys from the tweaks by using the same key generation function as the double construction. So it aims for what it calls delegation, but it does define what de delegation means. But under our framework, we can recast the app as a special case of the double construction with the old tweak space uh, becoming uh, the identity space and the new tweak space become is, uh, the singleton set. Namely, the only possible uh, tweak is the empty string. So our framework can be seen as formalizing the security goal for the app. Uh, in particular, in DFF, an identity is simply a binary string whose length is at most 13 bytes. And here's how it specifies the public math M0 and M1 for the key derivation function. So recall that in our framework, we want M0 and M1 to be in checked because uh, we want the subkeys of different identities to look independent. But DFF violates this constraint. In particular, M10 is the same as M100. So how should we interpret this issue? So there are two ways to interpret that. So in practice, most of the time, the input length and the identity length are fixed. So M1 and M0 would be injective in that restricted setting. And DFF is indeed a good IBFE scheme. But uh, if you have to support the full domain space, a full identity space, this is a design flaw weakening the security of DFF. And to illustrate that, let me now give a theoretical attack on DFF. So I would pick identity I0 as the empty string, I1 as 0, and I2 as 0, 0, and so on. Now I would um, query I0 to the exposure oracle and get back uh, uh, subkeys J1, J2. Now the problem here is that J2 is also the second half of the subkeys of all identities I1, I2, and so on. And at this point, those identities lick half of their subkeys, which sounds very bad. And we then can adapt the exhaustive search attack to recover one of the subkey of um, advantage much better than it should be. So in particular here, we improve the security. We de security is degraded by, say, seven bits. Uh, the attack is, of course, theoretical, but uh, the point is that 
it is quite a design flaw and it should be fixed. So in conclusion, uh, our works give a foundational treatment for IBFE, which is quite a natural extension for FE. In particular, we give the security notions and explore the relations. We then give generic attacks and then show some constructions with proofs. On the other hand, we apply our framework to analyze the security of PFF. Yeah, specifically, our work justifies most of the design choices of DFF, but also uncovers some of its limitations. That's it. Thank you. I'm wondering if you see, um, especially with the trend towards 256-bit um, keys, if you see an extension of your work to 256-bit keys and 256 bits of security, where maybe the subkey would be 512 bits? Does, does it extend directly or not? Uh, let's see. So it, it should, because we work on a general N. So if you, you want N to be 256, uh, then and uh, internally here, sorry. OK. So here, if your excuse me. So here, if your your AES is uh, AES two fifty six, meaning your N is two fifty six, then this gives you two fifty six bit security. Yeah, we work with a general parameter N, and here we work AES. We use uh, NS one fifty eight, but it's fine to use NS two fifty six if you use a proper primitive. Uh, any other questions? Thank you.